The Mom Hour is brought to you by partners like The Essential Calendar. The Essential Calendar makes beautiful, minimalist, poster-sized calendars that show an entire season at a glance so you can see and plan for the big picture. If you're looking ahead to 2024 and have big plans you want to see all in one place, visit theessentialcalendar.com slash themomhour. You'll save 10% off your purchase when you visit that link or when you use our code themomhour at checkout. Again, that's 10% off our favorite seasonal calendars at theessentialcalendar.com slash the mom hour. Hi, I'm Megan. And I'm Sarah. We're two moms with eight kids between us from preschool to teen. This is the show where we help you feel better about the mom you are and share our own parenting tips and personal stories. We're not experts. We're parents who've been there. We're not perfect. We're real. Welcome to the mom hour. Hey, everyone, and welcome to episode 112 of the Mom Hour. I am Sarah Powers here, as always, with Megan Francis. Hey, Megan. Hey, Sarah. It is Megan's birthday this week, you guys. It we is. have to acknowledge that. Um, of course. It's a big it's one. It's a big one. It's a big one. <laughs> I'm you... going, I'm going to be 40. Nice. Yay. Well, happy I'm actually birthday. looking forward to it. Yeah. I'm not a scared of this, of this number. So. You're not a scared. Not a I'm fe- not a scared. Not a feared. No. <laughs> and I'm really excited because I get to see you and hang yes. out with you. I'm coming in for the birthday yeah. weekend. So that's exciting. Um, what are we talking about today? Today we're talking about board games, playing games as a family, playing games with your kids. How to survive yeah. and even how to, enjoy how to it. actually enjoy it. I know it's, if you have really little kids, that could seem um, very unlikely <laughs> that this yeah. would be an enjoyable thing for you. But I promise it really can be. It really can. And it's one of those things I think when you're newer to motherhood, you look forward to like, oh, we're sitting around the family table playing games. And the first or second or third time you try it, you're like, oh, that didn't go so well. Right. You know, a kid is upset about losing or not following the rules. So we're going to get into all of that. We are welcoming our longtime sponsor, Prep Dish, back to the show today. And listeners, if you're looking to boost your protein intake, Prep Dish is making it so easy right now. When you sign up in January, you'll get access to a month's worth of the new Prep Dish Protein Boost meal plans. I love this, Sarah. Protein is so important for our health. It helps support mental clarity, sleep, energy, hormone balance, and more. And as busy moms, we're often not getting enough protein, especially at breakfast. With these meal plans from Prep Dish, you'll learn how to quickly prep four protein-rich dinners and one breakfast. Right. And like all Prep Dish meal plans, they make it so simple to shop once, prep for the week ahead of time, and save time on busy weeknights by having your meals ready to heat and serve. And Megan, these meals sound so delicious and perfect for January. Listen to this. Slow cooker carnitas bowls, stuffed pepper soup, and then there's a Swiss chard mushroom and goat cheese frittata for breakfast. Okay, I am adding that stuffed pepper soup to my rotation ASAP. This is a limited time offer, so make sure to sign up before the end of January to get your free bonus meal plans. To learn more and sign up now, visit prepdish.com slash the mom hour. Again, that's prepdish.com slash the mom hour for a month's worth of the new prep dish protein boost meal plans. Check it out. Sarah, you know when someone's trying to sell me something, I can be pretty skeptical. Maybe it's my rebel tendencies. But having some healthy doubts has definitely kept me from wasting money on every cool product the algorithm sends my way. You know what's not too good to be true, though? Our sponsor, Ritual, and their clinically backed Essential for Women 18 Plus multivitamin. Yeah, Megan, that's so true. We both love these vitamins because they're made with high quality and traceable key ingredients in clean, bioavailable forms. And they're gentle on an empty stomach with a fresh minty essence in every bottle. So you don't have to worry about nausea if you're a bit relaxed about when you take them. I'm also a big fan of Ritual's sustainability standards. They use scientific tools to select lower carbon packaging, prioritize sustainably sourced ingredients, and set ambitious climate goals. No more shady business. Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus is a multivitamin you can actually trust. Get 20% off your first month for a limited time at ritual.com slash the mom hour. Start Ritual or add Essential for Women 18 plus to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash the mom hour for 20% off. Okay, let's talk gaming. Family game night. Okay. Here we go. Um, so actually, I've been wanting to do this topic for a while because my family is actually entering into this phase where board games are tolerable. Um, my youngest is four and a half and <laughs> finally can kind of keep up a little bit. And um, we're going to get into some of that about including younger kids. We're going to actually get into that in some detail. But what's 
awesome, I think, Megan, is I remembered that you had written a post. So for brand new listeners, if you don't know, Megan had a very popular blog called The Happiest Mom, which was rebranded into The Happiest Home. And I came on as her editor and contributor. This is several years ago, and we wrote together there. So when we bring up old blog posts, that's what we're talking about. We no longer have an active blog in that way. But Megan, I remembered that you had written a post about seven ways to survive playing board games with your kids. And of course, I knew it was older, and I pulled it up, and it's more than five years old. Old, which means your youngest. I was just looking. Yeah, at this and it's like my so, youngest was three. Yeah, so oh Clara God. was three, and so and my youngest is four and a half. Um, but you were kind of in the phase where I am now, which is everybody's of game playing age, but there are still some <laughs> modifications needed to <laughs> yes. have everyone enjoying the same games. Plus, you have five kids. I mean, that's a big that's a big table, and there's a lot of you know. Yes considerations to include everybody in playing board games. So I looked up this post and I just, it kind of warmed my heart because so many of the things you talk about are like so pertinent to my life right now. And even a lot of them are the tips I was going to offer in this podcast to our listeners. So it's like full circle. Another thing I was realizing about where you are right now as, and what I didn't realize about where I was at that time is that it's not only tough because you have little kids, but it's tough because when they're all like little like that, they all want to play all at the same time. Yeah. That's something that's changed a lot for me. Like, my youngest now really doesn't care if she gets to play when everyone else does the way right. she did when she was three. Because so, she has again, other like, things that can keep her busy. Time. Yes. And she, uh, she understands that she can be patient and wait for her turn and all that right. stuff, too. Yes, so. it does. It changes so much. So, all right. So I thought for the first kind of half of this episode, I'm going to use this blog post as a jumping off point and talk about your seven tips to survive playing board games with your kids. And I would even okay. say enjoy playing board games with your kids. But it yes, does feel like survival. Survive it. Yeah. Um, so I'll kind of lead us through. We will link to this post in the show notes for this episode, which will always be at themomhour.com. And this is episode 112. So if you want to read it or share it with your friends or revisit some of these tips, we will link to that. So um, tip number one is don't underestimate your kids. And what you meant by that is there are board games meant for the preschool set. And there are also junior editions of classic board games. But what you said is your four-year-old may be able to handle a game of sorry or Yahtzee, especially if you make some accommodation. So let's talk about this. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think games marketed to preschoolers with a few exceptions. I'm sure we can think of some that we do like, but with, with a few exceptions, I think a lot of those games are not very well designed. Um, yeah, and they're not enjoyable for people who are not three and four years old. Um, and I think getting clever, (laughs) (laughs) getting clever with the accommodations we make to more classic games, um, is such a better way to go. So let's talk about some of those accommodations. Maybe you remember some from your family or I can chime in. Yeah, no, I do. I'm, I'm like, I'm having to rack my brain a little bit. Um, but I like you, I don't love the junior versions of games. I hate Candyland with like a white hot passion. I <laughs> memory. I'm okay with memory. Um, but there's a reason why those ones are big. And then I think like you're saying, like some of the ones that are sort of like an offshoot. Right. Of a, more grown-up game yeah they're just not fun they're, they're not often fun just kind of boring um so what we ended up doing instead was we would just change rules or mm-hmm. we would allow the youngest to have a uh, different rule so mm-hmm. like sometimes you know like i remember when i was a kid and i mentioned this in a later tip but i would play my parents let me play boggle but they allowed me to break the rules and play two letter words yes um so you know or you can you can set a timer and only play for 15 minutes and when 15 minutes is up it's up and yep. like the game is over and wherever you are at, you can play games where there's no winner. I yep. mean, we did that a lot too. When my kids are really little, there's a lot of ways to take a game and, and make it work. Sometimes everyone's playing with different rules and that's yeah. okay. it's like, it's your board game. You can do whatever you want with it. Yes, I agree. And I think so a lot of things that make, preschool games preschooly is that you don't have to read so that's and that's understandable because preschoolers can't read right. but if you can get around um, if you can find games that work without needing to read or if you can team up like team a little kid up with a big kid who can read or make allowances that we've played sometimes where the youngest can play with an open hand like she can show her cards yeah. and we will help her make decisions but she still gets to have yep. her own turn so if it's uno or if it's um, you know something like that she can play with her cards open so we can help her make choices, but she still gets her own cards and gets to play her own turns. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, absolutely. I love that you brought up. Similar. I love that you brought up Boggle because I love Boggle, and I, as like an adult, I love Boggle, and I for, kind of forgot about it for a while. And we got it out 
maybe six months ago. Um, and we took your two letter word idea to the next level where Brian and I will have four letter words and up the older two kids will have three letter words and up, or maybe I've even told them they can use two letter words as well. And Violet, who's just learning her letters, all she has to do is write down letters she recognizes because she's four. So she's recognizing letters, you know, and she really feels like she's playing. I will say for her, right. she's been very sensitive to feeling. She does not like to feel like the youngest. That's like a driving force yeah. for her. So we've had to be really careful <laughs> with accommodations not because to make she, it obvious, not to make it <laughs> obvious or to make it still feel fun for her. If she just feels like we're right. babying her, she's not going to buy it because she wants to be a big kid. So, um, I love this. So yeah, so the the general tip is don't underestimate your kids. And I think we would add to that, you know, get creative with your modifications. It doesn't have to mean you buy the games that are just geared toward preschoolers. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Love it. Yeah. So I think I, I feel like I kind of already answered some of the stuff in number two, tip number two, but that's okay because yeah, there are other things to be said. And I'm yeah, curious go for how it. you do this too. So my second tip was to create house rules. And that okay. was, you know, the boggle thing was one of them when I was young. That was how we did it. You know, we were allowed right. to play two letter words if we were under a certain age. Um, another house rule that we've had with um, like there are games. I'm trying to think if there's like any that come to mind where there's the ability to like steal or like you know, screw over someone else. Yeah, I'm sometimes thinking of will, Uno draw four. Will, like, <laughs> okay, yeah. like draw four and sometimes Uno. Sometimes we'll suspend that. Not yes. always. It's not like you can never play that way, but it's like only if you're playing with your older siblings and it's like a contentious game and that's fun. If it's not going to be fun for the whole family to be able to like literally make someone lose rather yes. than not winning. There's a big right. difference between not winning and being made to lose. And I think that there there's a mean spirited about that. Yes. Uh, mean spiritedness that can come out sometimes. And it's not fun with little kids. Like it isn't. Frustrated. They're not going to win anyway. It, and it's so, so they're like already frustrated. Yeah. And we're going to, I think we're going to get in detail about how it's hard for little kids not to win and whether we let them win. So I'll save that. Right. But I will just say that, yes, those I'm the first one that came to mind is in Uno, how you can make someone draw four. And sometimes you don't have a choice, Yeah, but I agree. I think it can feel it's worse than losing. It's like having someone pick on you. And I have one child in particular yes. who's so sensitive to that. And it just makes it not yeah. fun. Yeah. So we've suspended rules like that. And we've also made different point systems. Um, we play Catan a lot. And now we play all the way to 10 points. But we used to make it. We would only play to like tops seven, right. sometimes five. Right. And even to make that work with the game, you have to change other rules because... Otherwise, it's like it, you get there in like a minute. You right. know? So you have to kind of toy with that sometimes. And I guess, again, the, it goes back to the main point that this is your game. You can This is your family. Yeah. You can play this game however you want. You can change it from game to game or like from time you play to time you play to find the way that works for you. I will. I want to give a shout out to actually game designers and game instructions writers because I feel like this has gotten a little better. Um, just recently, we've played a few games where I've actually had to read the instructions. We started playing Catan. I was inspired by you. Um, and we were playing Risk over Vacation, which is not my favorite. But um, it seems like there are more modifications that are actually offered in the instructions. So if you have a game you feel like is too complicated, check the instructions or even like Google it. I feel like if you're not feeling yeah. like you could come up with a creative um, modification on your own. I'm finding that the games themselves, like both Catan and Risk have like a beginner version, like here's how you set up your board um, and here are some simpler rules. So I don't know. That could be, yeah, that could start I to like be a that. thing. Um, we have an edition of Sorry, a newer edition of Sorry that has some newfangled things that you do different oh, okay. rules than the sorry I grew up with, but they do offer a couple different ways to do it. Um, another modification that I know you don't like Candyland, but that bumped into my mind that I know you can do with Candyland is remove the picture cards. Or sometimes we play oh, okay. where sometimes you get all the way through the deck and nobody has reached the finish line yet. And so then we will remove the picture cards for the second time through the cards. Does that make sense? So that people aren't getting sent yeah. way back. You can also play with Candyland that the picture cards can only send you forward if you don't get one. Because you know the kid that's always disappointed when they draw like the gingerbread yes. man and yep. it sends them all the way yeah, backwards. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, just make those modifications. I love what you said about house rules because um, there's something that feels like this is how we do it in our family. And it's more of like a guiding principle that you start with instead of we're halfway through this game. Everyone's melting down. So we're going to change the rules right now. That can, I think, for some kids that feels unfair or even as adults, it could feel like we're cheating or being unfair. But I like if you start with this, um, start before you play the game or just in general, here's how here's how we do it in our family. Then it's less like. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a couple of house rules we have. One is that the winner cleans up. 
And this is from oh, I like that. when I was growing up. And it's just kind of a silly thing. Most of the time, we all help clean up anyway. But I will say it has gotten us out of some major disappointment about losing to be like, well, at least I don't have to clean up. So it's almost like yeah, it's winner cleans sure. up like or psychology. yes, like loser does not have to clean up. At least you don't have to clean up. Right. And so, <laughs> you know, we kind of laugh about it. And usually it's like, haha, you have to do the big cleanup. And then we all end up helping anyway. But that comes that was right. even from when I was a kid. Um, so, yeah. Create your house rules. Make the modifications. Okay. So here we go. Yeah. Next, next tip. Number three is fake it. And I'll just read what you wrote. So your toddler's probably not going to figure out the point of monopoly unless she's a genius. Our three-year-old Clara, who's now eight, plays board games with us in that she gets to roll the dice, move a pawn and arrange cast off cards. Of course, she's not really playing, but she gets to spend time with us as part of the group and is free to get down and play if she gets restless. Okay. And so here's where I'm just going to come right out and say this never worked for Violet. She was never. Yeah, I could that. It's just her strong-willed personality. She was not fooled, <laughs> yeah. and she didn't want to like play with uh, her own deck of cards right next to us. Or, um, and I had other friends recommend the same thing, and I was like, oh, she's just not buying it. But now she's word. finally yeah. able. So if you have a kid like that. You're not alone. Um, but I do think this works for <laughs> a lot of kids. So the, yeah, yeah, the equivalent would be you give them their own hand. They get to hold their own hand. They get to roll the dice. And then the rest of the group just kind of plays. Moves along. Moves along. I well, think. Well, and, and I will also say that for that, it works to a certain point, even to let them play, knowing they're not going to really win or yeah. even understand the game can work until they want to ditch that's yeah. when sometimes it gets you know it like because they've been playing and they've been holding the space and like suddenly now yeah. they're like i want down and that's so you know like having her completely out of the actual play of the game was easier in yes some ways. Uh, yes and i can see why that totally wouldn't work with violet no and she once she got mad she could take down a she could flip a board game like a angry drunk Irishman I don't know like she she just <laughs> she would just wreck the whole thing when she got mad it was bad for a few years um so but I do think this works I think this is a good tip just maybe not for the very maybe strong will Violet. maybe Violet is you. the exception to some <laughs> to several rules a and special tips. case <laughs> you should just get her a t-shirt that says special case yeah I'm special um, yeah. um <laughs> <laughs> this is a good time to mention because I'm afraid I'm going to forget it. The playing card holders. I've mentioned them one time on this show before. But um, if little ones who have trouble holding a whole hand of cards, especially a big hand like Uno or something, um, they're just plastic. Yeah. You can get them on Amazon. I've seen different ones. I have to say I think ours are the best. First of all, ours, you don't have to hold the playing card holder in your hand. I've seen some where it's like you hold this little wand and your cards it's are like tucked into it. your hands or something? Yeah, well, you oh, hold it like okay. a handle. Yeah. But then if you put it down you still have to then put it down and pick it up ours is like it's it stands on its own and it's sort of curved like in a concave shape like you would curve a hand of cards so that nobody can see them and then the cards just tuck right into them and even really little kids can use them so um that's kind of a a random place to mention that except I just didn't want to forget and I will link to that in the show notes it's 10 bucks for two of them and we've used them for years and I've seen others and this is I really think a really good version of that idea so cool so number four, um, set a timer. So I would I said like over the years I've realized just because my kids are bugging me to play a game, that doesn't mean they care if we finish it. So recently when they had we had a limited amount of time, I would set a timer or put a restriction on the game. And I mentioned earlier that we would only play like in Catan only play to five or seven points. Right. Um, but sometimes also setting a timer, just knowing I only have like to invest twenty or thirty minutes yeah. in a game makes it that much easier to actually fit it in. And sometimes if the kids were really disappointed about being done and I'm yeah. done in air quotes at the 20 yeah. or 30 minute mark. We might leave the game sitting out yes. with the idea that we come back and finish it later, but often no one cared. We right. get to the end and it's like, yeah, do we really need to keep this game going? And the only person who wants to keep it going is the person who's winning. Yeah. <laughs> so, so true. You no, know, I mean, nobody else wants that game to keep going. So most of the time the vote would be, let's put it away and try again later. So I, it always worked for me and sometimes still does. I, I have a lot to say about this because I okay, really do not like long board games myself I don't they just make me feel trapped and claustrophobic and I want to escape and Reed will he can sniff out the longest most complicated board game 
in like a house. We'll go on vacation or we'll be at somebody else's house and he will find like the game that requires six players and six hours and is so complicated. And so this has been a point of tension in our house for several years. Um, I'm really glad you brought up the stepping away and stepping back. That's actually been a better solution for us, probably because my kids are still a little bit younger. Um, so I will say I will play that game with you, but you have to set it up, first of all, because like getting out yes. a million pieces and reading the instructions and you set it up. I will come to the table when you're ready and we need the ability to play for 15 minutes and then step away and come back to it later because I can't I just can't and I won't um so I one tip there is to set up a game like that somewhere where it can be it doesn't have to be cleaned up so if you have a side yeah. table somewhere or somewhere where you can revisit it and then yeah like you said it's not gonna like it's gonna stay out for six weeks but we you know given enough time either the kid will lose interest or maybe you will actually finish it but I have to break those up into manageable chunks because I just don't enjoy them I really don't enjoy epic. yeah I, get, I I know what you mean so I have those times where I can play an epic long board game and it's fun like the holidays I feel like I can do that because yeah. I just I've already put everything else on hold and this is like holiday time yeah i'm the same way if it's just like an, a random evening at home i don't i i won't even sit down at the table if it's going to be two hours yeah. before i can get up so um definitely the timer thing has really yes helped. and i yeah i think that would that would be good and I, I think i might actually try that one next time instead of just say no i'm not gonna play that with you right <laughs> all right <laughs> no way. um no there are games i just say no um i won't play um okay tip number five is team up so we kind of touched on this before but teaming up a younger and an older um i think that is a good strategy for so many reasons um, i mentioned one which is any game where you have to be able to read if you have an emerging reader or a kid who can't read yet um or you know any of those then pairing them up and also kids who are sensitive about losing which is a lot of kids um so then then it just sort of puts them on a team where they can i don't know live or die with the team like win or lose with a team yeah. it seems less isolating than losing on your own especially if you're sensitive about being the youngest or always losing or whatever so did you did did this yeah, play I mean, out with your multiple kids multiple ages with yes. pairing up yes it it did well and i will say like it worked particularly well when there was like uncles, aunts, cousins and stuff involved. We would usually give the younger kids the choice of who they would pair up with. Oh, that's and nice. if you were like an older kid, you kind of had to take it. Like if your little, you know, four year old sibling wants to pal up, you know, partner up with you and you're 10. I feel like you're mature enough to say yeah, yeah and mm -hmm. not be like, but I want to play on my own. I mean, you'll have another chance to play on your own. That's right. This is just not that chance. This is a family thing. And, and this is, you know, this is what we need to do to make this game work. And I will say my kids have, for the most part, all been great about that. I love but giving the youngest more fun when yeah. yeah, giving them a choice. Cause that, yeah, that's so like, like you were saying with Violet, like you, they don't feel like they're being cut out or yeah. they're just being like, kind of an add on right and everyone's just humoring them they get yeah. to choose and i just think that that makes them and then the the sibling that they choose usually is a little flattered by it yeah so it's or the aunt or the uncle or cousin um so that's worked really really well for us and they depending on how old they are or, or their ability level they might get to almost i mean like when owen was six he was really good at strategy games he just yeah. needed help being reined in so yeah. his problem was he would he would just have these wild moves and he'd be like like he didn't need a partner, but yeah. the game always went better for him when he had a partner because yes. he could use his strategy mind without like going totally off the rails, yes. buying up all this property that doesn't go together or whatever. And it was, so it just worked out better um, yeah. that way. And I could, so we, we would still do that with Clara on certain games. I was just going to say, it doesn't have to be just the little tiny ones, but there's so many benefits to teaming up and you have a big family with lots of cousins. So I can see how some games you'd have to team up because they're not 12 person games. Um, <laughs> but I was just thinking about Reed, like you said about Owen, he's also has a very, very strategic mind and he's very bright. His issue is more uh, managing his emotions with like the highs and lows of getting frustrated, winning, losing. And I can see how in yeah. the same way that Owen was moderated strategically, Reed would be moderated emotionally by having somebody to be like, it's okay, we'll get him next time or whatever. And not feeling like yeah. he's on an yeah. island. So I love that. Yeah, um, feeling like you're part of something. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Especially if it's like a favorite sibling or cousin. And another thing I will say is about Owen is, I mean, he now is pretty good about managing his emotions. But when he was seven, <laughs> we called him rage quitter because he <laughs> was the king of the rage quit. Because he would just be like, ah, no, and then he'd be done, and then he'd, you know, skulk off, and then the game's ruined, because no one wants right. anyone to be unhappy, right. you know? It's oh, fun yeah. if it's, like, good-natured ribbing, but if someone's that angry, oh, they, yeah. like, Actually, literally take their pieces and leave. <laughs> Reed is not the rage quitter. He's the rage 
repeat player. So he his rage is he always wants to do it over because it's like he's convinced that oh, next no. time he'll win. So it's like he's like an addict that way. He's like next time we'll be better. So he's like the rage the rage repeater. That's so funny. Is yeah and and funny. very common. Okay, I love your tip number six. Um, I will set it up, but so smart. Okay. And this is keep games in plain sight. So basically, you say have a select few games that are easy to access and they're out and so that you don't have to go rifling through a big bin or closet through like 25 games that most of them are not something anybody wants to play so this is like the same the same concept as rotating your toys and having fewer things out but having them organized and easily accessible it's just so smart yeah, I mean, I found that like at first I had these games and I was I had games still left over from when I was younger that I had carried it around with me throughout my adulthood. And then I had then the ones we bought on top of that and they were all in one closet. I was like, this doesn't make any sense. Like every time we want to play a board game, first of all, there's too many choices. Right. So instead we would narrow it down. And I found that in our family, we get in, we kind of get in these, I don't know what the word I'm looking for, like a jag where we'll play the same game over and over and over for a month. And then we move on to a different game. Right. And that's fine. Like that's. Great, actually. I think it's kind of fun. And it makes it that much more likely we'll actually do it. Yep. Because that game tends to be sitting out on the table or yes. the buffet. It's just easier to access. Yeah. And it's like, it's kind of like when your kids want to watch a movie and you open, like, well, it used to be like the DVD case or now maybe it's your streaming service. But when there's so many choices and you have multiple kids, the, the decision making process alone can make you want to, like, run out into traffic. So having fewer choices <laughs> and having them all be things that, everyone is mostly okay with then the then should yeah. we play sorry or should we play Yahtzee or should we play a card game is such an easier decision so but there's something about just having them out easily accessible and visual um that just ma- I feel like would make kids gravitate toward them so I'm going to take your tip on this one as well ours are pretty well organized and pared down right now but they are still in a closet and the kids need help reaching some of them so I'm going to try this of mm. having just a few easily accessible I love that yeah. idea yeah, it, may, it just makes it that much easier. Okay, so... So should I take this last yeah, one? Yeah, yeah, because this is a good one. Okay. Okay, so tip number seven, the last one, is throw the game. When Owen and I started playing Monopoly together, he was five years old, and he somehow won every other game because I let him win. <laughs> so yes. this strategy gave him a little boost of confidence but it, and encouraged him to keep playing, but also made the games so much shorter, which made it that much easier for me to play. So. Yeah. Again, I'm not like advocating you always let kids win, especially when there's other kids involved and they're like, why is, you know, they're not likely to allow that to happen. But if you're doing more one on one or with another older sibling who really doesn't care. Right. Or or with a younger sibling, you know, there's a way I've had before where I'm like, oh, my gosh, you both won. Yeah. That happened. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Wow. I didn't even think that was possible. Um, I think that just being willing to like just know especially if it's something like checkers or Chinese checkers like those are really easy games to just let the other let the kid win you're gonna get it done faster everyone's happy and you can kind of like feel good about the fact that you played the game and then moved on I don't know I feel like this is it's (laughs) not bad advice and I'm here with research to back you up so oh good yeah all right so um first of all it's really common i think to have the reaction like oh no we're not supposed to let our kids win because they need to learn how to lose graciously so yes kids need to learn how to lose graciously and that doesn't happen when you're three four or five years old and it doesn't happen by always losing think how you would feel if you always lost that's really not a good strategy (laughs) for losing gracefully um because it's just demoralizing so um I read a book a couple years ago called Playful Parenting, which is by Lawrence Cohen, and I'll link to it in the show notes. Um, And the book is about all kinds of things and um, really more about how much of parenting we can sort of like turn into make believe and play with our kids and how good that is for them developmentally, yada, yada. Um, But he talks at length about why it's okay to let kids win. And in particular with kids who are, I'm going to say like three, four, five, six, even seven years old, when life is kind of hard, they are all, they are feeling small and out of control Mm -hmm. and like they don't have, they don't win at a lot of stuff when you're a little kid and how, purposely letting them win at certain times. And this doesn't mean always forever. If you're still letting your eight-year-old who's a, you know, competent, well-adjusted eight-year-old beat you every time, then probably it's time to shift gears. But with those little kids who, you know, really often are struggling with just being a kid, um, letting them win and not only letting them win, but really kind of like 
playing into it like oh my gosh you keep getting the best cards like how is this happening kind of yeah. playing into this like like the bumbling the bumbling loser right, like, like wow yes, like yeah. um can be a huge confidence booster for kids and um the better they feel the more likely they are to continue to want to play and little by little by little you can win you can let them win less you can over time kind of wean them off that and what i love is that you kind of summed it up in this post without having read that book or done that research but you were doing the same thing you realized owen needed to win it was in your best interest to keep him happy and i guarantee you don't let owen win games now that he's 11 oh no and now he's good enough he doesn't need me to help exactly him. and he can just he can win on his own and you know also kids need to learn how to be good winners yes Full winners yes that's just as important as learning how to be a graceful loser and so if they never win like you said first of all that's so demoralizing but then they never get a chance to know yeah. what does it feel like to be win what yeah. is the what are the feelings of the other person like having that empathy right imagine if they lost 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 and finally started winning at like age eight or nine because they finally had the skills right and we're just like evilly triumphant yes, because they've yes, been waiting they've been beaten years. down <laughs> <laughs> yes exactly that doesn't seem healthy either so that approach has always worked for us and has not backfired in any way so I'm really glad that uh, research, research backs up it does well the other thing I love about this did. this being the final tip is I feel like um, if you've done some of the other things we've talked about teaming up with older siblings modifying the rules playing in small batches or setting time limits a lot of that would um make for less of this need to have like a big winner and a big loser because we've talked about it if you're teamed up you at least have a buddy that you're either winning or losing with and this losing graciously and winning graciously is being modeled and you're adjusting the rules so it's not so um biased against the little kids so i almost feel like this this need to throw the game and let the littlest win is actually it's less of a need if we're also doing all of these other things in conjunction does that make sense that's really true yeah and i would say that the throwing the game was almost exclusively when it was just me and, a, yes. and just me playing with the kid. Yes. Because it was, that was when it was way more unevenly matched. It's yes. like, I'm 35 and I'm playing with a four-year-old. Well, who do you think is going to win yes. every 100% of the time if, if I don't start throwing the game? So, you know, what's yeah, one that, more thing nice. I want to mention on throwing the game is there's a difference between throwing the game and letting a kid cheat or circumvent the rules and we talked about modifying the rules at the start that's different than I have one or two kids who likes to suggest that we modify the rules in the middle of the the game when it's to their advantage and I actually think that letting them win and making those modifications ahead of time then you can be pretty strict about like I'm not going to play if you're going to change the rules in the middle of the game that's not fair Um, but if you've done all these other things then hopefully they don't feel like they need to do that does that make sense so so that's those are two very different things I I would be pretty strict about having my kids stick to the rules that we've agreed with and actually I think in this book he actually recommends that you can you can ask your kid at the beginning of the game what are the rule. Tell me the rules to this game. What happens if you draw this card? And get them to buy in on the rules, and then you make them stick to it. Because that's different. Playing fair is different than letting them win. I think there's a there's a difference there. Yeah, so. and, it, and the letting them win thing doesn't really work unless they believe they won either from their own yes. skill or their own luck. Right. They know they like cheated to win. Right. That's not, that does not serve the no, purpose. No, nobody's so, been helped. And that's why I think that with little kids, especially playing it up, like, oh my gosh, yeah. you're so good at this. Like, just, just right. play it up and let them feel it's good. Fun. Well, Megan, I've been wearing Vionic shoes for over three years now, but this month, my trusted shoe brand and I entered a new phase of our relationship international travel. Well, Sarah, that is a serious commitment, (laughs) right? You can't just pack any shoe for a trip abroad. It's got to be stylish enough for those major cosmopolitan cities. It's got to be sturdy enough for trains, planes, buses, and city streets. And obviously it's got to be comfortable enough to support your feet over many, many miles of walking. Well, no surprise, my Vionics were up to the task. I had two pair with me, a pair of casual sneakers in a cool gray color, and then a weatherproof suede ankle boot that I swear still looks brand new after 10 days on soggy sidewalks. Megan, the only time my feet hurt the entire trip was New Year's Eve when I made the mistake of wearing a pair of booties not from Vionic. So I'll just leave that data right here for you. Okay, well, that's pretty conclusive, Sarah. Vionic has the best curated styles to get you ready for whatever 2024 has in store, whether it's jet setting like Sarah or keeping up with busy mom life on this side of the pond. They even offer a 30 day guarantee, wear them, love them or return them for a full refund within 30 days. And we've got a great deal for you. 
Use code the mom hour 15 at checkout for 15% off your entire order at bionicshoes.com when you log into your account. That's a one time use only. Bionic Shoes, wearable well being for your feet. Sarah, when my kids were little, I was always pretty torn on whether to give them a daily multivitamin. I knew that modern kids' diets have some pretty big nutritional gaps, but I also knew that most children's vitamins are basically candy in disguise. They're filled with sugar. They have all kinds of chemicals and preservatives in them. And I was like, why would I give these to my kids? Luckily, two dads recognized the problem and came up with a solution. Haya, the pediatrician-approved, super-powered, chewable vitamin. Haya fills in the most common gaps in modern children's diets to provide the full-body nourishment our kids need with a yummy taste they love. Formulated with the help of nutritional experts, Haya is pressed with a blend of 12 organic fruits and veggies, then supercharged with 15 essential vitamins and minerals, including vitamin D, B12, C, zinc, folate, and many others to help support immunity, energy, brain function, mood, concentration, teeth, bones, and more. Your first shipment comes with a cute bottle that has fun stickers your kids can use to decorate it too. My kids always loved that. And we've worked out a special deal with Haya for their best-selling children's vitamin. Receive 50% off your first order. To claim this deal, go to HayaHealth.com slash MomHour. This deal is not available on their regular website. Go to H-I-Y-A-H-E-A-L-T-H dot com slash MomHour and get your kids the full body nourishment they need to grow into healthy adults. Okay, so we're going to just spend another few minutes or so on the topic of games. Um, I thought I would share how we've been organizing our games in this house. I know every house and storage is different, but it's a little different than just a cupboard full of boxes. So I'll start with that. Um, We because I'm in Southern California, we don't really need a coat closet or but all houses have them. You have an entry closet, you know, in your house. So we use that for mostly just board game storage. And also my printer is in that closet um, on top of kind of a tower storage thing. But um, I was getting tired. There's not a lot of shelving in there. And I was getting tired of the boxes that get all dilapidated and like, you know, the top of the board game box is like the seams the corners start to flatten out and a lot of times there's a lot of wasted space inside like there's a little plastic caddy but you never put the things back in the holes where they're supposed to go so because I interrupt you really quick and say (laughs) that I I don't want to be like the grumpy old lady like shaking my stick but they do not make those board game boxes like they used to. They feel like they're made of like yeah. the cheapest possible yeah. cardboard now. So it's like they just disintegrate. I know what you mean because we have a couple old ones and they are more sturdy. That's so true. Yeah. Kids, kids these days. Um, yep. OK, so hear me out. I haven't gotten rid of all the boxes, but I have gotten rid of a lot and I completely get rid of the box. I recycle it, throw it away. Okay. Um, Ooh, because, this right. is a, because this is a coat closet, it has a hanger rack. So I use coat hangers and Ziploc bags for all of the small pieces. So let's say Candyland is a pretty simple example. Candyland has four game pieces and the cards themselves. So those are in like a quart size Ziploc bag, which is poked a hole through it over a coat hanger. So the the pieces and the cards hang on a coat hanger. And then all I have left is the board, which we have this um, like a mesh tower storage thing with drawers. And so now the board has, I used my label maker. So it says Candyland on the outside. So you can easily see which board, which um, folded up game board it is and it's in a separate place but it's so minimal because it's so flat does that make sense so you have your bulky stuff hanging from the coat hangers and you have your game boards all just stacked in a row so when you want to play a game you get the board and then you get the pieces and you put them back so it's a little different that that actually okay so i have to say when you i have this (laughs) weird thing where i feel like obligated to hang onto the boxes but you're right it makes total sense to not because all of the things you all the things i said about how they're not well made anymore most for the most part and then what you said about like you know, they fall apart. They'd like look terrible. Yeah. They don't stay. They start and to they, like cave in. So there's like wasted space. Anymore. So unless you have unlimited right. shelving and this particular closet only has one shelf, you know, like the, the high shelf where uh, in a coat closet. So that's all it has. And yeah. the rest is open space. So we have this, um, kind of drawer tower thing. Um, but the, the board boxes don't fit or the game boxes don't fit very well in these drawers either. So I ditched most of the boxes. Um, the nice thing about the coat hangers is you can see in the Ziploc bags, which of the 
the game pieces are there and it's all there. So if the game is life, which we're going to get to, cause I hate the game of life, but that has a bunch of <laughs> random stuff. It has the money. It has the cars. It has like the weird spinner. Um, but it's all in a Ziploc bag. And then you just grab the board and you grab your stuff and away you go. So it's not all of our, I'll try and take a picture of this for the show notes. Um, it's not every single game, but it is really cut down on the number of boxes we have. And I have, there's no love lost with uh, getting rid of those boxes for me. So that's pretty genius. And I think I might have to steal that idea. I don't know. You actually need coats for your closets. That's the problem. <laughs> your <laughs> coat true. closet has coats in it. Um, do you have any, I know we talked about just paring down and rotating which games are out. Do you have any other sort of organizing tips to add there? No, that was basically my only tip. So now I'm just going to have to steal your idea and then and then I'll be organized. Yeah, but yours work. is pretty good. I mean, having having fewer games, just like toys, getting rid of the ones, just just be Marie Kondo and just part with them. Just thank them for their service <laughs> and let them go if they're ones that you don't like or that are incomplete. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or that and, we're just not into right now. Yeah. 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 Agreed. You know, put them away, but they don't have to be out all the time. Right. Yeah. That's a good idea. Okay, so now we thought we would go through a few recommendations of our favorite games. Probably not a completely exhaustive list because there's a bunch and a bunch are good for different ages. But I'll just uh, fire off some that are top of mind for me right now. And then what we thought would be fun is at the show notes at themomhour.com. If you go to episode 112, we will put together a little guide and I'll even organize it by age. So if you're in the market for board games, we will link to a bunch of our favorites. So, okay, so here's mine. Um, Sorry, I mentioned earlier sorry is a game that i grew up playing and there is a new version out it has a few twists or new bells and whistles you can there's like an ice and fire thing that happens um that gives it a little more strategy i will say even though i'm a purist and normally i would resist it's actually pretty fun to play with the new rules you can also find classic sorry i've seen both so um you don't have to be able to read i feel like my four and a half year old can play sorry and that's a good one um, apples to apples, we have had a lot of fun with. We have the junior edition, but just like you were saying, Megan, earlier in the episode about how you don't always need the junior edition, just recently we've been having the older kids play the regular apples to apples. It's just a lot funnier. Um, apples to apples is subjective. You know, you're choosing what the kind of funniest or best combination of words is. And um, I ju- we just found that the junior version, we weren't laughing as much. It, we, you didn't have the opportunities for irony and and just funny pairings. So the only downside is a lot of times there's celebrity mentions that my kids do not know who they are, but they just skip those. So <laughs> um, there's also another similar game to Apples to Apples called Pickwits that we got as a gift. And it's like the same idea where you're pairing a concept with another concept. And sometimes it's a funny or ironic pairing, but it's with pictures. So you don't have to read for that one. Um, Guess Who is a great game for four, five, six, seven, eight-year-olds. I love Guess Who. That's one that I will always sit down. It's only two players, so that's a downside. And we've had a couple different versions that fall apart or that have like these plastic uh, parts that kind of can get loose. Um, So I think depending on the version you get, some of them hold up better than others. But I think it's a great game. Um, we've talked about Candyland, Uno, Boggle. We are classic card games people in my family. Like my dad grew up like poker playing and blackjack and mm-hmm. rummy gin cribbage. Like w- we are like old men in that regard. Now, some of those are a little above my kids skill level, but they're still games that we'll continue to play as adults and teach our kids. So both Allegra and Reed have started to learn cribbage, which is one of my favorite games of all time. Um, and so sometimes all you need is a deck of cards or in the case of cribbage, it's a little game board, but, um, we love card games. Uh, Go Fish and Old Maid are always good options. I think you can play those with a big group, even if they it's not all just little kids. Um, and then you mentioned Memory. I think Memory is a fun one. And that is another one that I think has some modifications, like where little kids could feel like they're playing, but just their memory is not as good. Right. <laughs> but like if they get a turn to flip over <laughs> the tiles, they're still at least playing. So I think that's another one. And then the last one I wanted to mention is catchphrase there's a way to play catchphrase like where you buy the game but there's actually an iphone app that we do all the time on vacation so catchphrase is where you have a partner or team members sitting in a circle and you're trying to get them to guess the word that you're looking at without saying that word so it's really simple but it moves really fast and when the buzzer goes off you don't want to be caught holding 
the catchphrase thing. In this case, it's just an iPhone. It works perfectly on the iPhone. Um, and we've played with all ages. Um, so that is an app called Phrase Party. And it is a paid app, but it's been totally worth it. It's like four bucks. And we've used it so much. And yeah, I've used it in groups of adults with the kids. Um, you can do it with maybe four people would be the minimum, but then up to big groups. So that's a fun one. So that's what I got. And I will link to all of those in the show yeah. notes. Those are some good ones um, and some that I didn't actually um, know about. I don't think that I knew catch. I, I didn't never heard of um, Pickwits. Yeah, it's that is a newfangled one, but it's yeah, it's been fun. Okay. OK, well, my list has got some of the same as yours. Um, so, of course, we're big settlers of Catan. Um, I also love classic card games and I love that you mentioned like all you need is a deck of cards. Like there's endless games you can play with just dollar deck of cards yep which i love that it just has endless uh, opportunities and options for like traveling and when you're going someplace and really all you want to bring is a deck of cards or if you forget to bring anything with you on a trip you can always find a deck of cards at the gas station or anywhere so that's just like so versatile um i also love everything in the uno family so like skipbo phase 10 uno there's like a bunch of offshoot games and they're all different but they all are like similar enough and the cards kind of look familiar so it's like it doesn't take you as long i take forever to learn new games and for some reason anything in that sort of uno family i feel like it doesn't take me as long to learn um scrabble is a big one for me yahtzee it travels really really well i mean all you have is like a little cup some dice and then the the yahtzee papers that can be done almost anywhere and they probably even have like a travel version of it i haven't bothered because i've found that the that regular yahtzee is fine you can play it right inside the box um, yes. Which is good if you're like camping or something where the dice can scatter. Um, I personally love Monopoly in Life. No. I know. <laughs> I know Sarah doesn't. You know, for me, Monopoly in Life are like long. It's kind of like the difference between sitting down with a, you know, an article from The Atlantic versus like uh, reading, you know, someone's Facebook post. Like it's <laughs> it's long form game playing. And I'm I have to be in the mood for it for sure. Unless I really crazily alter the rules to make the game a lot shorter. I really have to be ready to sit down for a long time. And I know that's not your bag, Sarah, but I do like both of those. And I found them, um, life has gotten updated. What I loved about life when I was little is it felt like I could be anything. Like it was just my life and like I could be all creative. And the thing is you really can't be like at some point the game kind of decides for you whether you're going to end up in the poorhouse or, or not. But I don't know. I still like, I think it for me, some of it's nostalgia. Okay. And I'm ending with Chinese checkers. Like I love Chinese checkers. It's so simple. You can buy it and you can buy a, uh, a version at the dollar store if you're on vacation and you forgot yours. You can use a nice one at home. You can have it sitting out. It kind of looks pretty. You can get like the the um, those really nice wooden boards and it looks pretty. And you can just have it sitting right out on your table. And just it's like one of those where you can just impromptu grab it and up to six people can play all at the same time. Or two people can play and almost any kid with some guidance can learn how to play it. So that's one of those that I just love. It's like a go to for me. So well, that is, I mean, I could go on. but Yeah, no, I want to <laughs> talk about Chinese checkers for a second because I kind of forgot about that. Does it look like, is it where the board is like wooden and there's little marbles? Is it like in the shape of a star? Am I picturing that correctly? Yeah. Yep. Sometimes it's marbles, sometimes it's little pegs, but it's like the shape of a star and there you move the, the object is to move all of your, I want to say like 12, like your little pyramid of uh, marbles to your opponent's empty marbles as they move so the empty spaces that they leave you move into theirs and they move into yours okay the object is to just get all of your little pegs or marbles into theirs and them to get into yours so whoever gets there first wins and the game can go quite quickly sometimes if you've got like six playing people playing it goes it takes forever and it gets very complicated and fun but i i really like it yeah that is going to be simple that's going to be on my list because i'd forgotten about that one it's fun when we when we talk through these like in your own mind it's like well these are all obvious games but that one wasn't to me and i would like to get that one that's going to be on my list i also wanted to add about yahtzee because i love yahtzee um and going back to my game organizing tip that is one where yes you can definitely play in the box and that's a good advantage of the box but the box also you don't need that much space like you said it's the cup and the dice and we have also found you can google the score sheets if you run out or if you're on the road um, and if you have a printer or print before you go you can print more score sheets so we've done that before with Yahtzee too Smart. Yahtzee is another one where you could modify you can play just the top half if you want like it can get long and yep. complicated with all the math and so love Yahtzee um, okay so 
maybe is it even worth mentioning games we don't love? I'm going to say a few that I can just admit that I don't love. And two of those are Life and Monopoly. It's not that I don't love the long form because I've gotten into Catan since we took the time to learn that. That was really fun. Um, I don't know. I didn't play Life growing up, so I don't have the nostalgia factor. It's more that my kids want to play those games and I don't have the long form ability right now to sit down and play those. So it might be more of a situational thing. Um, Monopoly, I've never really loved. I never got enough out of it to make it worth the time it took to play for me. Um, another yep. little kid game that I don't love is Shoots and Ladders. And it seems similar. <laughs> it seems similar to like Candyland or those others, but I, I by far prefer it's Candyland. It's pointless. It's pointless. And more specifically, <laughs> kids have to count and kids are really bad. Oh. Kindergarten teachers will tell you this. Kids don't get one-to-one correlation or there's a name for it in learning. It's one-to-one um, where they're able to go one, two, three, and actually move their piece on each square one at a time Um, and then you know how in shoots and ladders the numbers are they zigzag up the board so I feel like kids are always going the wrong direction and not counting correctly and now I'm sounding just really controlling about it Candyland at least is colors (laughs) it's like even a three year old can go two reds but to go to to space 72 and have to or no to go like six spaces and have to go in the right direction on shoots and ladders is too hard for the kids that that game is supposed to be fun for in my opinion and then my last one is anything with weird equipment so we have a couple of and these are usually kind of games that are not classic board games but um we have like that pie face game that will spray you in the face with whipped cream and it has like this weird oh my god little like terrible yeah it is terrible and um (laughs) we have another one that has this like large awkward electronic thing basically like i want my game in a box or something i can take out of a box and put in a bag so large bulky equipment is off the list for me and those games i feel like are flashes in the pan generally yes. speaking yes you know they they don't stick around so twister though um, twister almost has weird equipment do your kids ever play twister did you ever get out the twister no mat? oh yeah i have not owned twister since i maybe i've never owned twister i, I kind of just feel like it's the kind of game my mom would have been slightly disapproving of <laughs> for <a> real reason <laughs> so, <laughs> i it's not i don't have a lot of history with twister i don't have any i don't have any like I don't know nostalgia about it. it yeah, what it is, and I've yeah. never bought it. Yeah, so. we don't have it. We um, used to, but I got rid of it. And it can be fun. Like I've played it before at a party where I had a good time, but I've just never. It's never occurred to me to own it. So yeah. Um. I'll, okay. So I don't really have any specific games I can think of off the top of my head that I hate, except for I don't like I don't like Candyland. And I don't like Shoots and Ladders. I think that just goes along with my why are we even doing this thing? Like there's <laughs> what is, to me there's like the what is the point? Like all we're doing is going from here to there and like in between what's the point? And so I've never liked those. Um, but for me, I'm finding that I have a lot of resistance to new games that come out, even the ones that people love. So like people keep talking about, for example, ticket to ride and I actually got it for my kids for Christmas. And I am terrible, terrible at reading and absorbing and comprehending, um, game like board game rules yeah I really have a hard time like it takes me I th- sometimes feel like something's wrong with me because I'll read through it and then I'll read through it again it's like reading a recipe like a really complicated recipe right. I get to the end and I've already forgotten the first step um I can't I can I'm often like going but why and I want I always <laughs> want to know the why to any game and also be like but why are we doing this like what what is the point just show me like tell me what the point is and then maybe let me watch two rounds of play what ends up happening with some of these games I'm finding is that you don't figure out the routine in the first round it's not like what you do on this roll or the next roll it's like everything adds on to the last I don't know they just they my brain for that is so is just like so not functional that so I find myself unfairly I guess like writing off new games and right that ticket to ride isn't the only one I've bought other ones where I was like I just don't I just don't get it I don't know so if anyone has played those games and can convince me that even me even my weak little puny brain can absorb it and learn how to play it without you know too much work I'll give it another shot but right now I'm like guys can we just play like Yahtzee yeah. I already know how to play Yahtzee <laughs> I hear you I, I hear you on that I, I'm probably the opposite I, I like to read and follow the instructions as they are written but I also think there's plenty of classic games that doesn't always need to be and so I, I think I have a general suspicion of new games as well would love to hear from listeners if they have game recommendations that are new I have one more that I forgot to mention that is a great all family game and I mean big groups it's a dice game, dice game and it's called Left Center Right have you heard of this megan no 
Okay, so literally there's three dice, um, and on the dice are either L's, C for L for left, C for center, R for right, and it determines where you pass your money. And we've played with real money, or you can play with chips, and it moves really fast. There's no strategy. It's all luck. It's all dice rolling, and somebody at the end gets a big pile of whatever, chips, fake money, real money. Cool. Um, and so it's a really great like vacation game if you have, and it travels in a tin the size of a deck of cards, because it's three dice, and that's it and then if you want to use you know chips or something to count your money so that's another good one that i will link to it's cheap portable great for all ages so um well this has been really fun um it is and you know what before we wrap i just want to say that i was just talking to i think my sister recently about what a hard job it would be to create board games like really how complicated it can be sometimes to like figure out the strategy and how the point systems work and all of those things. So I just have to have a shout. Like I'm sure there's no board game designers listening to us right now, but if you're out there, I really respect the work. Cause it's like a good board game is a piece of art. It is not an easy thing to pull off. Um, no, nope. I've known because I've tried to like make up rules before and it doesn't. Always yeah. Go and well, the good so. ones, there are a lot yeah. of bad. There are a lot of poorly designed games out there, I think, is that's been a theme in this yeah. episode is the classics are classics for a reason. And games that are well designed, that are, appeal to lots of different types of people are good finds. So I also want to say yes. that if you are in the phase where you think it's supposed to be fun to play board games with your kids and it's not fun yet, please see our episode 110, also known as our episode, I don't know, 10, which is called We Hate Fun. Like, we've been there. We have been there when it is, you think it's supposed to be fun and heartwarming to play games with your kids. And if your kids are two, four, and six, that's just not going to be that fun. So look ahead to the future. And hopefully we've offered some tips for, you know, incorporating games when you do have really little kids, but also just be patient. That's our general, our general theme is it will get better. And I am actually having fun playing games with my kids for the most part, as long as it's not life. Love it epic life um (laughs) okay so warby parker is our sponsor today your uh at home try on five pairs of glasses no obligation to buy ships free you get that at warbyparker.com slash the mom hour all lowercase um definitely go check that out and everything we talked about will be in the show notes at episode 112 themomhour.com love it thanks all The Mom Hour is brought to you by partners like The Essential Calendar. The Essential Calendar makes beautiful, minimalist, poster-sized calendars that show an entire season at a glance so you can see and plan for the big picture. If you're looking ahead to 2024 and have big plans you want to see all in one place, visit theessentialcalendar.com slash themomhour. You'll save 10% off your purchase when you visit that link or use code themomhour at checkout. Again, that's 10% off our favorite seasonal calendars at theessentialcalendar.com slash the mom hour. Hi friends, Megan here. I wanted to let you know about a new podcast I've just launched called The Teas Made. Think of it as a weekly cozy conversation with me over your favorite hot beverage on topics like wellness, creativity, family, hospitality, and more. Just look for The Teas Made with Megan Francis wherever you get your podcasts or head to theteasmade.com to find all those episodes. The Teas Made is your reminder to take a little break from the busyness of life. So come on in and get comfy. The Teas Made.